Hello and welcome to the Reviews Brothers. Graphics are often a big topic of debate among gamers, some saying they aren't important as long as the gameplay is good, others saying they can't play games that don't look hyper-realistic. I'm in the former group of people, I don't really care what a game looks like as long as it's fun. However, if a game does look good, then I'm all for it. Back in the early 2000s, a new graphical style was showcased called Cell Shading, where graphics were bright and colourful and looked they were right out of a cartoon. Since then, there have been a bunch of games that use the style to great effect, and I'd even argue that almost all of those games that use the style still look fantastic to this day, and it's a real shame that it's not really used nearly as much as it should be. So yeah, here we're going to look at a bunch of the games that use that graphical style, and before you say it, I did deliberately leave off the Wind Waker even though it probably is the best example of one. But hey, you've got to save something for part two, don't you? Anyway, this has gone on too long, so how about I shut up, you press that subscribe button, and we take a look at some games. Jet Set Radio! We are going to start with Jet Set Radio, as it was one of, if not the first game to use cell shading. At the very least, it was certainly the game that put it on the map for most people, or screen, I suppose. Jet Set Radio was originally released for the Dreamcast, but has since had ports to a few consoles. This is the Xbox 360 version. The story here is that you're part of a gang, of which there are a few, and all the gangs have these new magnetic rollerblades and love to go around tagging their turf, so the other punk gangs know where not to show their ugly faces. Also, big corporations have started to take over the city, which I believe is loosely based on areas of Tokyo, so you have to help free the city by doing what you do best grinding and graffiti. So yeah, the story is a bit nonsensical, but it is fun, and the crazy cast of characters from the awesome DJ Professor K to the angry inspector that's trying to hunt you down are all great. The actual gameplay is split into medium-sized level, where you have the time limit in which you have to explore your part of the city and tag all of the highlighted objects with your gang signs. To do this, you just have to find it and hit the tag button on anything that's highlighted. If it's something small, you'll automatically tag it, but if it's a larger object like a bus or a wall, then you'll need to follow some on-screen prompts to complete the job. It doesn't take long for the law to arrive, and they'll constantly chase you all over the place, so you have to make sure you have enough time to tag the larger objects so they don't beat your ass. Also, on some levels, there's rival gang members trying to graffiti over your graffiti. Bastards. So you do have some competition. Tagging costs paint, but luckily there are loads of spray cans littered all throughout the city. These also respawn after a while, so you should always have a few in reserve. If not, it's a good idea to spend a few minutes exploring and finding a load so you don't have to worry about running out. Also, getting around these levels is loads of fun. Skating is easy and grinding on pipes, rails and just about anything with an edge is really cool, and you can often lead to hidden areas filled with power-ups and more paint. As you can see, the game looks incredible cell shading style combined with the cool character design and overall art style is just really good and the animation is fantastic too. Everything's just so bright and colourful and you wouldn't think this is a 20 year old game. Well this is the remaster but you know what I mean. Also the game has a real focus on music and that means the soundtrack is also really good with some awesome dance and hip hop playing throughout. My only slight gripe with the game is the jumping and momentum which can take a while to get used to but they are something you will get used to. The jump is a little too floaty for my liking, but it doesn't ruin the experience. Playing the game for this video was actually the first time I'd played it, and I did end up playing all the way through as I was just having so much fun. I would say that this is a must play, and really worth owning on whatever system you can get it for. Auto Modelista is a racing game from Capcom that uses cell shading, which isn't something you see very often. In fact, a racing game from Capcom isn't something you see ever. This is the GameCube version. So yeah, it's a racing game, but it features a ton of cars to choose from, from all your favourite motor manufacturers like Ford, Nissan and Ferrari. Now I'm anything but a car person, so I don't really know or care much about cars, though I'm sure if you do, your favourites will be here. You've got a few game modes to choose from. There's Garage Life, which is essentially your career mode, where you choose a car and complete a bunch of races. As you race, you earn money and unlock new parts that you can purchase to upgrade your car with. It has a real focus on customization, and the car that you make in this mode can also be used in other game modes. As you'd expect, you start off pretty slow with dodgy handling, but you can improve it all quite quickly. 
you can also buy new cards as you play and tune them up, again with all of them being an option for the card select in every other mode. Or if you want to, you can just choose the base form. Is that what you call it, the base form? Or oh, I've been watching too much Dragon Ball. You can also have single races, time trials and of course multiplayer. You get a fair few tracks to choose from with more being available to unlock as you go. The tracks all take place in real cities and some of them are pretty long being up to 5 minutes per lap, full of twists and turns. This is where some of the problems come in though. The handling for the cars just isn't that great, even after you've done some tweaking to them. It is very drifty but not really in a good way and it's very easy to spin out even on a relatively simple corner. Also, if you touch anything that isn't the road, you often come to a dead stop or slow down way more than you probably should. It is possible to do some sweet drifting though, and it is very satisfying when you do. The computer AI here is pretty tough. You can choose a few difficulties, but even on the easier settings it's still pretty hard to win a race, but I guess you can just get good. Graphically though, the game looks great. Again, the cell shading really helps keep the style, and the little effects like speed lines on the screen work well without distracting you. There's weather effects too, and the whole thing just looks really good. There's a great amount of detail on the tracks, and the cars look really cool in this cell shaded style. The controls are simple enough, as it is kind of an arcade style racer at heart, but as mentioned, the handling could have been a lot better, and it really is what brings it down for me. The game also feels a bit like a budget game, with its simple presentation and game modes, but there is a surprising amount of content here if you can be bothered to go through it all. I do have to say that the music is really good here and gives me Ridge Racer vibes, and also the announcer is the same bloke from the Street Fighter Alpha games which is always a plus in my book. Overall I'd say that this is only an average racing game, but it does look really good, but it doesn't play that well, and it is kinda boring after just a short while. I wouldn't say it's bad, but it's really not one that'll keep you interested for too long. Black and Bruised is a wacky boxing game released on all the consoles of the PS2 generation. This is the GameCube version, you'll see a few of those here. Anyway, it's a boxing game, so you know what to expect really. You've got a crazy roster of characters, each with their own stats for strength, speed, reach and movement. As you can probably guess, the characters tend to be slow and strong or fast but weak, and everywhere in between. But no matter who you choose, you better believe they're going to be wacky and full of one-liners. This is a boxing game that very much leans into its cartoony visual style. Each character has their stereotype clothing, voices and animations, similar to how the Punch-Out games did it, but not as good. Here you have a few game modes, you can do a simple championship where you choose your pugilist and take on opponents to win a title, then you have survival where you can see how many people you can beat off in a row before you get knocked out. And then there's Boxer's Life Mode, which I actually really like, as each boxer has their own individual story with fully animated cutscenes between each fight and a voiceover that explains the characters' motivations for fighting and how they all get themselves into these situations. It's a really nice touch and actually made me want to play through with every character, not that I did. Oh, and then there's the Training Mode, which I highly recommend doing, or you'll be like me and get your ass kicked a lot. But how is the boxing? Well, it's fine, but not amazing. I will say that I've never been good at any boxing games, though I can do punch out, but that's all about learning patterns and not actual boxing if you know what I mean. Here you have four punch buttons, left and right, high and low, and you'll need to use a combination of them all to break your opponent's defence, which is very hard to do as they block just about bloody everything. You also have a button to change if you're blocking high or low, and you can dodge left and right as well. And you'll need to keep an eye on your opponent, and watch them closely to know when and where to block and attack. It's all just too much for my tiny brain. When you can get some attacks in though, you can put together some nice combos using the left and right punches. Doing this builds up a star meter at the bottom of the screen. When your stars get to the centre of the bar, whoever gets there first gets the power up that's in the middle of the screen. This changes every few seconds and range from things like health power ups or speed or power or sometimes even something that just stuns your opponent outright. When you have the power up you can use it at the press of a button to get the advantage, but what's cool is that if you don't use it straight away you can carry on building up your stars and this levels up the item. When you've got red stars around the item it means it's at its most powerful and the best time to use it, but of course you may not have time to wait if you're being pummeled. Whoever you're fighting can also collect these power-ups, so be careful. The game really does take a bit of practice to get into, but it can be fun when you start to win a few fights and learn a few combos. 
Of course, the graphics look really good with the cell shading, and each of the characters has their own personalities, though the animations while you're fighting are a bit dodgy and quite jerky at times. This can make moving around the ring and landing punches quite tough. Also, there's quite a few times where I'm sure the collision detection wasn't quite right, and my punches that should have landed would just miss or go through the other person. This is never fun and kind of essential in a boxing game. I do like that all the characters have their own rings based on their stereotype though, so you're not always just fighting in a boring ring the whole time. I did actually have some fun with this one, and I've actually owned it for years on the GameCube, but I wouldn't say it's a particularly great game. It would be more fun against a friend, but doing the boxer's life bit is a bit of fun and the humour isn't bad. Give it a go if you're into fun boxing with a friend, or like a punch up with mates, but just don't expect a masterpiece. Vehicular combat game Cell Damage used the cell shading as a big selling point when it was released for the GameCube, PS2 and original Xbox, and it seemed to work well. I bought it on release for the GameCube, and since then have bought the HD remaster that came out for the PS4 generation, and that's the version you're seeing here. Cell Damage is a car combat game where you choose from a bunch of crazy cartoon characters, each of which has their own vehicle. You can choose from a handful of game modes, there's Battle Royale where you have to just attack everyone you see and the first to score a certain amount of points is the winner. Then there's Flag Mode which is just capture the flag, you've got to find it somewhere on the level and take it back to the designated flag area to score a point, while making sure your opponents don't do the same. And then there's Race Mode where you have to race laps by following the checkpoints around a level, first across the line is the winner, simple. So there's not a ton of game modes here, but what you do have is always fun and short bursts. The levels you complete are all impact with weapons for you to collect. All of these can be used by every character, but everyone does also have their own unique special, which is often an instant kill attack. Weapons are all very Looney Tunes, from extendo boxing gloves to dynamite, giant buzzsaws, tommy guns, freeze rays and more. You'll soon find the weapons you like, and they tend to be in the same locations, so you'll learn a good way to get them. Characters have health bars, so you'll be able to easily pick out people you want to kill, though the action here is crazy fast and frantic that you can often find that you're dying every few seconds, just like they are. I quite like all the characters here. You've got a nerd in a hovercraft, a gangster duck in a 1920s black and white car, a dominatrix in a pink Cadillac, a builder and a digger, just to name a few. And yeah, they do all control differently to one another, with some being faster and having better handling, etc. But to be honest, it never really makes a huge difference. There's only four worlds, the Swamp, Desert, Space and Horror. Each of these has three sub-levels to choose from. You'll need to play through all of them in order to unlock the other ones, as well as a few hidden characters, as each world has its own boss. But realistically, you can actually unlock pretty much everything here in just a couple of hours. The real focus though is the multiplayer, and this is clearly a game designed to be played with four players sat on the sofa, and that's easily where the most fun comes from. What's good is that you can still unlock everything while playing in multiplayer, so that really is the way to go. Of course, the graphics here are excellent and one of the best examples of cell shading. Playing on the PS4 looks fantastic and really shows off the bright colours, though it still looks good on other systems. The characters and worlds all look right out of the cartoon, and you get character-specific cutscenes which are all pretty fun. This is another game with awesome music as well. If you like fast, frantic multiplayer games, then this is one I'd recommend. There's not a whole load of content here, but if you're playing with friends, then you will have a blast. I would probably say you're best off getting it for the GameCube or Xbox though, and plugging in four controllers. You can play the PS4 version online, but I doubt there's much of a community for it. But do check it out if you can. Escape Dead Island is a spin-off to the exotic, half-naked zombie killing simulator that people seem to either love or hate. Personally, I quite like it. Anyway, in Escape Dead Island you play as a reporter who's trying to get the scoop on what happened in Benoi, the island from the first game, and that she goes to a different island where the evil Geo Farm also has a presence and you want to expose them. But don't you know it, everything goes to shit and zombies start popping up all over the place and you've got to try and escape Dead Island. I see what they did there. The action takes place in third person and you're free to explore a fairly large island quite freely. You'll need to find items and weapons to craft things and this will often open up new areas when you find things like ropes or grappling hooks. So you'll need them to climb areas or make lockpicks to open doors etc. You do have a list of objectives, 
may need to find a way off the island as your boat sinks at the start of the game, so you'll explore every nook and cranny to see what you can find. Of course, there's also zombies all over the place, and you'll need to find some weapons. There's a few types here. You get shivs, which you can use on enemies if you sneak up behind them for an instant kill. And there's an abundance of blunt and bladed weapons, so you'll find baseball bats, sword things, and even things you can craft, like a bat with a blade attached to it. The combat is easy, and you have a weak and strong attack, but of course there are more than two or three zombies, then it does become tricky, and you can die pretty easily if you're not careful. This is where the stealth comes in. Stealth is a big part of the game here, and you'll often find yourself sneaking around an area trying to take out zombies silently, rather than running in guns blazing. Oh yeah, there's also guns in the game. Doing this keeps the noise down and stops the other enemies from getting alerted. Of course, this isn't always possible, depending on the situation. Enemies have an alert meter above their heads, so you'll know if you're about to be spotted and need to make an escape. Just hide somewhere for a few seconds and the dumb rotting corpses will forget that you were even there. There's also a bunch of special types of zombies, because you can't have a zombie game without special types of zombie. Some are much faster, some jump, some can run at you, and some are like tanks. You need to make these guys a priority if you can. You also find survivors along the way that you can rescue for XP. Doing this helps you level up and improve your abilities. There's quite a lot of cutscenes here, but sadly, pretty much all of the characters are fucking annoying. The main guy is your typical wise ass who's just a sarcastic bastard and has an answer for everything. He's actually quite unlikable. I know he's meant to be cool and he does get a bit more sympathetic towards the end, but Jesus, does anyone actually like these types of character? Why do so many games have these arrogant tosses as their main characters? But hey, it pushes the story along and I didn't really mind watching the cutscenes. Graphically, the game looks really good. I think the cell shading actually really suits horror games, which might sound a bit odd, but it's not always bright and colourful and can give a decent atmosphere. It's never a scary game, and something I like is that the draw distance is excellent and seeing miles ahead is really cool at times. Also, all the blood and guts looks really cool in a cartoony style and helps them be able to go completely over the top with them. Control-wise, the game is decent enough. The stealth mechanics aren't perfect, but they do the job. This game was a digital-only release, so it's not the longest game you'll play and can be beaten in just a few hours. Now, I know this game actually gets a lot of crap, but I love zombie games, so I had to try it out, and I actually had a pretty fun time with it. I would say that it's actually worth playing if you like the original series, or just zombie games in general. I still think that horror games in a tropical setting is a fantastic idea, and this is definitely not a bad game like some of the overdramatic people on YouTube want you to believe. It's a perfectly fine game, it doesn't do anything particularly special, and it's not the best game out there, but it has some really cool moments and it plays well enough, and more importantly, it's fun. Though I doubt it matters, as it's a digital game, so you probably can't get it anymore anyway. Go Go Hypergrind for the GameCube is a strange skateboarding game that's a cross between Tony Hawk and Jackass. There is a flimsy story here, and the whole game is basically a crazy cartoon TV show, and all the characters want to be the star, so have to prove they're wacky and have what it takes. Or something along those lines, anyway. So to do this, you go to a bunch of levels on your skateboard that are filled with things to do tricks on, so you'll find half pipes and conveniently curved walls to do your usual tricks on, as well as plenty of grind rails, so you can rack up a massive score. There's also things to break and collect, which are all part of your objectives in the levels. But the biggest and most unique thing here are the interactive environment hazards that you need to use, make use of to get the most points. Basically, scattered around the levels are crazy hazards. Things like spikes, fire pits, giant hammers, and so on. When you get close to one of these hazards, a button prompt appears. If you press the button in time, then something crazy will happen, like setting you on fire, blowing you up, smashing you across the level, or squashing you. Something you'd see in the cartoon, basically. You get more points while you're in these states, as being on fire will last a little while, for example. Then you can combo them together, or use them to get to new places. For example, you can set yourself on fire and then find some dynamite to blow up. This will fling you across the level where you can land on a grind rail and rack up massive points. On some levels, you'll need to find a way to get flattened down, so you can get into a small gap where an item might be that you need. This is kind of fun, and I like exploring and seeing what combos I can do. There is a story mode, and you'll choose a character, and you've got more objectives, and sometimes even have to battle other characters by collecting weapons to throw at them to knock them out. These are good fun, and of course you'll unlock more levels and characters as you go. The characters all play differently, and are generally all easy to use. 
They control similarly for the most part, but do have a few tricks of their own. And speaking of tricks, these are actually quite limited, which is a shame. There's only a handful of grabs and flips you can do, but the main focus here are the traps, so it doesn't matter too much. But be careful when you are doing tricks, as it's very easy to come off your board. You really need to get some height if you're looking to do any grabs or flips. In fact, the controls overall are just a little wonky, and controlling your character is trickier than it should be if you ask me. But it's manageable, and with a bit of practice you'll be getting some high scores. Though for me, what made it hard is that I felt that the camera was way too close to your character, making it hard to see what was going on ahead of you. I couldn't see any way to change this, and I'd often misjudge things because I couldn't quite see, and some of the characters are massive, which doesn't help one bit. It does look damn pretty though. The graphics here are excellent, and the cell shading looks great. All the levels are packed with cool details, and the characters all look really good, with excellent animation and humour. Some of the special tricks in particular are really cool. Overall though, this is another game that's just kinda average. It was good fun at times, but others I just found it a bit tedious. I do love the graphics here, but it's not really one that I'm going to go back to in a hurry. I feel like it's one of those games that if you had it growing up, you'd probably love it and have some really fond memories of it, especially as the developers clearly like big boobs. Hey look, it's the first Pokemon game I've covered on the channel. About time, eh? This is Pokemon Rumble for the Wii, a game that Belt Buckle Bill introduced me to. It's a simple game where all the Pokemon are actually little toys, and the aim of the game is of course to catch them all and make your way through a bunch of levels while getting stronger and learning new moves so you can take on bigger, tougher opponents and eventually be the best. The gameplay is incredibly simple, so simple that even Belt Buckle Bill could do it. You hold the Wii remote sideways which is good as it means there's no shitty waggle here. You choose your starting Pokemon and head out into the level of your choice from the hub world, where you'll find dozens of other Pokemon on each level, usually of two or three different varieties per level though. You fight them in real time battles by just pressing one of the two attack buttons. Pokemon you defeat drop money and are even sometimes captured. At the end of every level there's a massive boss fight as well. Attacks have a cooldown period that differs between moves, so you do have to be tactical and of course using the correct type of Pokemon is essential, as all the usual damage types still apply, so using fire against water isn't a good idea. Any Pokemon you catch can then be used from the next stage onwards, and you can have up to 6 Pokemon in your party at any time. These can be switched out at any point at the press of a button, which is a really nice touch. Pokemon can't get any health back during a level, so you do want to bring your strongest ones with you. They don't actually level up here, instead you have to just capture stronger ones, which can mean repeating levels a few times as you won't always get the ones you need. Once you beat a level though, all your Pokemon are healed and any that were defeated are usable again for the next stage. The levels themselves are all fairly short, you just follow a single path until you get to the boss and that's about it. Between levels you can go to the shop to buy random Pokemon and even a few new moves for them to use. They can have up to two moves each, and you can have multiple of the same Pokemon, so you do have a few options for move sets of who to take with you on watch level. After you've beaten enough in the main stages, you can take part in a battle royale, where you have to fight 60 or more enemies and be the last one standing. These of course are, these of course are a lot tougher than normal levels, and if you win, you move on to the next set of stages, which have new, tougher Pokemon. Repeat until you've collected them all. And that's really all there is to the gameplay, it is a deliberately simple game. The graphics here use cell shading for the Pokemon, but everything else is just sort of normal looking. This was a download only game available from the Wii store, so it does all look very basic and not that impressive. The animation is minimal and there isn't much detail anywhere, though some of the environments don't look bad, but it's really nothing special. As it was a downloadable game, it's probably no longer available unless you happen to have a modded Wii, but of course I wouldn't know anything about that. This is a fun little game that would kill a couple of hours and it can be played cooperatively with up to 4 players. It would definitely be one that younger audience would enjoy. Now we all know that Borderlands is the daddy when it comes to cell shaded FPS games, but what about Tower of Guns? Did you know about that one? Shown here on the PlayStation 3. Tower of Guns is one of those roguelike games, at least I think it is, I'm still not entirely sure what that means. Don't keep up with the kids in your lingo. There is a story here which is basically that a tower filled with guns and traps is in town and anyone that can get to the top gets a free bar of chocolate. So you set out to see if you can make it without having your face blown off because you bloody love Galaxy Caramel. 
When you first start the game you have a basic weapon and not much in the way of anything else. The idea being that the more you play, the more weapons, power-ups and perks you unlock, making subsequent playthroughs easier, though never easy. The levels are all randomly generated, I believe, so the game is never the same on two playthroughs, which is also where some of the challenge comes from, as there's times where you'll breeze through the first few rooms while it gets harder, and then other times where you're immediately bombarded by literally hundreds of enemies and die right away, and if you die once, it's back to the start of the game for you. The levels themselves are actually all large rooms, and there's a ton of enemies in most of them. A lot of them are gun turrets that fire rockets or sometimes homing missiles at you, but there's also a large number of robot enemies that can chase you, cut you with blades, or just shoot your face off. You really have to be on your toes as things will be coming at you from every angle, something Toby Von Doom from the Secret Levels podcast is used to, so he's probably really good at this game. You'll also find money in the levels and get it from defeated enemies. You can use this in the levels to buy new weapons and power-ups, though I did actually find that this was kind of useless, as everything costs just a ton of money and I rarely had enough to buy anything, which I guess is where the multiple playthroughs comes in, as the perks you get can give you more money and things like that. After every few levels you'll fight a boss. These are generally not too hard, in terms of crazy patterns or anything like that, but they do become close to FPS bullet hell with the amount of crap that's fired at you from them. In fact, a lot of the levels end up like this too, but if you like blowing things up, then this is definitely something you'll be into. The weapons you get are a mixed bag. They're not your standard style weapon. Instead, they're more like junk weapons that someone has made themselves. You always have unlimited ammo for whatever weapon you're using, and you can level it up as you play, so it fires faster, stronger projectiles, and sometimes even adds to how many have fired at any one time. But again, leveling up your gun is slow, though it does stay leveled up for your next playthroughs. So yeah, you want to get those perks. Normally, I use the one that means you don't get full damage, but you can also have a double jump, faster movement speed, and things like that. It can be a bit frustrating when you first start playing the game, as you will be dying a lot to start with, but well, that's kind of the point, and you get better and you'll earn better things to help you get further. The graphics here are really good, I really like the style. It is very Borderlands, and there are times where you'd be forgiven for thinking it could be a Borderlands game if you only saw it for a second or two. Though, for a game basically about explosions, they are surprisingly lacklustre and dull looking. In fact, a lot of the effects are a bit crappy now I'm thinking about it. Playing on the PS3 is fine, though I did experience a fair bit of slowdown, pretty much every time I played, as things get pretty hectic on screen. It really affects the controls and gameplay, making it hard to dodge anything. I would imagine the PC version is much better in this regard. Overall though, this is a fun game and it's worth a few quid, but don't pay full price for it. And if you can get the PC version, I'm sure that's probably the one that you'd want to play. Ultimate Spider-Man, shown here on the GameCube, is one of my favourite Spider-Man games, but for some reason doesn't really get talked about. It came out after Spider-Man 2, which is still what gets all the praise, even though I'd say this one is a much better game in just about every way. Oh well. It's your usual Spider-Man story, the main plot here being that Venom is on the loose and wants to eat you, and just about everyone else that he sees for that matter. So you spend your time fighting and avoiding him. Meanwhile, the usual selection of villains pop up, like the Shocker and Rhino. They all have small roles to play, and usually end in a cool boss fight. Of course, in between fights, you're free to swing around New York as much as you like, with the story only progressing when you go to the designated place on your map. As it's New York, there's always a ton of crime going on all over the place that you'll need to stop from muggings to gang warfare, carjackings and even people that have had traffic accidents and are trapped in their vehicles. There's also activities like web races you can take part in. Some of these are just time trials, but others are against the Fantastic Four's Johnny Storm. Beating these gives you permanent stat boosts to your swinging speed and abilities, which is pretty cool. And that's the main thing here. The swinging and movement around the city is just so damn fun and easy to do. You'll be a pro in just a few minutes. Like Spider-Man 2, you do actually need to have something to swing on, so you can't just swing around in open areas like the park. Here you'll need to use your jumps and use your web zip to move properly to get around. But when you're among the skyscrapers, you'll have a blast swinging like a loom. What's awesome is that you can also control Venom for his parts of the story, so you get to see what's actually going on with both characters. Venom plays very differently, not being able to web around, but you can jump crazy far, and you can pick up and throw vehicles and things to kill those pesky cops, and maybe even Spider-Man. You also have to absorb them to get your health back, which is fun. 
You don't control Venom nearly as much as Spider-Man, but whenever you do, it is a ton of fun and a nice break in the gameplay. The only thing that really needed some improving is the combat. It is perfectly functional, but doesn't seem quite finished. The attacks work, but the hit detection is very wonky, and the animations are all just a bit awkward. It's nothing too complex though, and you can fight three or four people at once with relative ease. When you're about to be hit, you'll see your spidey sense. When this happens, you just have to jump out the way. It would have been nice to have a proper dodge as it takes you out of the fight when you do have to do this. The story is told with some really cool cutscenes that all look awesome. The cell shaded graphics here are done just to look like the comics, and you often get comic style panels that appear during the cutscenes and it works well and looks great. Spidey also has his usual quips which are good, I'm not that keen on the voice actor they chose, but he does the job well enough. But as far as Spider-Man games go, this is one of the best I'd say, and it doesn't get nearly as much love as it should. It's on all the consoles of the GameCube era, and also I used to have the PC version at one point, if you want to go that way. Either way though, this is a must play for any Spider-Man fan. And finally for today, here is XIII, or 13 if you don't want to be a twat about it, which I recently started replaying after getting the Xbox version which you are seeing here, and was the inspiration for doing this video. 13 is a great first person spy shooter based on a comic book series with an emphasis on its espionage story, after you wake up on a beach with no memory of who you are or what has happened. You're rescued by a sexy lifeguard who is quickly gunned down and then you have to set off to uncover the truth about what's happened. Turns out you've been framed for the murder of the president, but did you really do it? Who knows? The game is incredibly ambitious, combining a mix of first person shooting, stealth and story elements. And I do have to say, it actually holds up really well and actually pulls most of them off. I remember this game got just about average reviews on its release, but I really can't see why as it is just so much fun to play. Missions take place in a variety of locations across the world and are packed with enemies, weapons and items. Depending on the mission, there might be a load of civilians too, so you can't run around killing everyone, but if you can't kill them, you can usually knock them out without being penalised. To do this, or to knock out enemies for that matter, you tend to need one of the many items littered around the levels, like a chair, a broom, a bottle or something like that. You can find them and pick them up and use them to smash people over the head and knock them out in just one hit. You see, stealth plays a big part, and it is possible to go through the majority of missions without being detected from the majority if you wanted to, but I do like shooting people, so that's what I did when I could. Thankfully, the shooting here is also very good. You get loads of different pistols, shotguns, rifles and sniper rifles to use, and they all feel really good. You also get gadgets like a grappling hook that you can use at certain places to help you get to new areas. You'll also find health packs that you can use whenever you need to, which is handy, as it can be easy to die. Turns out, being shot isn't good for you. As mentioned, the story here is a big part of the game, and it's told really well. You can get cutscenes before and after each level, and also during the levels. David Duchovny voices Jason Fly, the main character, and he does his usual half bored sounding spiel, but I like it. 90s singer Eve plays Jones, your partner, and they both do a good job. But it's just the way that the game is presented that is so good. Comic book style panels will appear on the screen as you play to show you nearby enemies that you need to be aware of that are about to spot you, or maybe they're going to be setting off an alarm. Or if you do a particularly skillful kill, you get a triple replay in boxes that pop up as you carry on playing. It's really cool and something that should be used in a lot more games. Also, there's a lot of little touches here and there. For example, if you stand still and there's an enemy nearby, you can actually see their footsteps appearing on the screen just to let you know where they are. These are really cool touches. Obviously, one of the main things that people remember are the graphics. The cell shading here just looks amazing even to this day. I can't believe this is an original Xbox game, which is backwards compatible, so the footage you're seeing here is actually me playing it using the real game on my Xbox 360, and it just looks awesome. Some of the animations are a little bit basic though, but all the characters and weapon models are great and the levels themselves are really cool. This is definitely a game to show off how good cell shading games can be. Now you'll likely already know that the game got a remake in 2020, which was slammed for being a really crappy cheap remake, and they even changed the graphic style so it wasn't cell shaded anymore, which was basically the main selling point for the game. Apparently the side effect of that was that people went out and bought the original instead, which is somehow still the better game, but I'm okay with that as it's a lot of fun. 
It does have a few janky things in it, like some dodgy stealth and escort parts, but overall it really is a fantastic game that's way better than even the reviews of the time would lead you to believe. I highly recommend playing this game through, especially as it's really cheap if you get it for one of the old consoles. Sure, do get the PC version of the original if you can, but if not, I would recommend the Xbox version as you can play it in glorious HD on your 360. So there you go, a bunch of games that are cell shaded and still look amazing. There's a load more out there, so be sure to let me know which one are your favourites, and which ones I should include if I ever do a part 2 of the topic, which I think I will at some point as I really like cell shaded graphics. But for now, all that's left for me to say is thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.